Hi, my name is Dr. Joe Dispenza. My undergraduate training is at Rutgers University where I studied biochemistry. I went on to get my graduate degree at Life University outside of Atlanta, Georgia. In the last seven years, I've been very interested in studying spontaneous remissions from diseases. In other words, conditions where people had been diagnosed with cancer or diabetes or rare genetic disorders that medical science had no solution for. I studied people who had cardiovascular conditions like tachycardia or arrhythmia or high blood pressure, people who had high cholesterol levels, emphysema, endocrine problems like thyroid values changed. And I was interested in finding out if there were some things that were common amongst these people. And I found that there were f actually four things that were common amongst every person that had a spontaneous remission. The first thing that was in common was that every person accepted and believed that there was a divine intelligence running their body. Some people may call it a spiritual intelligence. Some people may say it's a greater mind or a deeper mind. But they all accepted that there was an intelligence that was much greater than them. Now, if we call it this mystical intelligence, a spiritual intelligence, there's really nothing mystical about it at all. You see, it's the same intelligence right now that's keeping your heart beating. Your heart beats two gallons of blood every minute, over a hundred gallons of blood every hour. It beats a hundred thousand times in one day, forty million times a year, and over three billion times in one lifetime. It pumps consistently without you consciously thinking about it. Now, if we think about it, there's some order, there's some intelligence that's giving us life, that's keeping our heart beating. It's the same intelligence that's digesting our food breaking down food into gases and, and nutrients and taking that food and organizing it to repair the body. All of that's taking place without us conscious of it. And these people began to realize that there was an intelligence running their body that was actually greater than them, that actually knew more than them. And if they could connect with this intelligence, maybe it would do the healing for them. You see, every single second, we lose 10 million cells. And the next second, we make another 10 million cells. Now, we don't think about doing that. You and I are free-willed individuals. But there's an order, there's an intelligence that's doing it for us. And in every single cell in the body, out of the 100 trillion cells that make up our physical body, every cell goes through 100,000 chemical reactions every single second. Now, if we multiply that by the 100 trillion cells, we can see that there's some intelligence that's giving us life consistently. Now, the interesting thing about this intelligence is that it has a will independent of our will. It consistently and constantly gives us life. Its will transcends our will. Its mind transcends our mind. And it, it keeps an order in the physical body. An example of that would be like little enzymes running through the DNA of our, of our cells. There's 3.2 billion nucleic acids that make up the genes in one cell. Now this intelligence sends proteins up and down those nucleic acids and changes mutations so that we don't fall apart. Now if we think about this, this intelligence is giving us life consistently. And these people said, I'm riding on the back of a giant. And if I could just learn to tap into this intelligence, it will do the healing for me. That's the first thing that they all accepted. Now the second thing they all believed in was that they understood that their thoughts, the way they thought over a period of time or their thinking actually contributed to their disease. And they said, if my thinking's contributed to my disease, maybe I should change the way I've been thinking over the last several years. Now every time we have a thought, we make a chemical. If we have good thoughts or we have elevated thoughts or happy thoughts, we make chemicals that make us feel good or happy. And if we have negative thoughts or bad thoughts or insecure thoughts, we make chemicals that make us feel exactly the way we're thinking. So as every chemical is released in the brain, it's literally a message that feeds the physical body. Now the body begins to feel the way it's thinking. Now once we begin to feel the way we're thinking, an amazing thing happens. The brain, which is in constant communication with the body, checks in with the body and it starts to think the way we're feeling, which then makes more chemicals to allow us to feel the way we're thinking and think the way we're feeling. And we get caught in this loop between the brain and the body of thinking and feeling. 
The ultimate side effect of this is that we create a state of being. And that state of being becomes the way in which we think. In other words, feeling becomes the way in which we think. And when feeling becomes the way in which we think, now we're caught in a loop where our body is literally thinking for us. Now these people reason, they said, if my thinking's created this condition, and my thoughts create these chemicals that make me feel a certain way and behave a certain way, I'll have to change the way I think. And so they set out to begin to interrupt this process. That was the second thing that they had in common. The third thing that they had in common, which I found really astounding, is that these people decided that in order to break their thinking process, they had to reinvent themselves. They had to become somebody else. And when they began to think about who they wanted to become, they stopped this feedback loop between thinking and feeling, and they started to ask themselves some important questions. Questions like this. What would it be like to be a happy person? Who do I know in my life that's happy? What would I have to change about myself in order to be a different person? Who in antiquity do I admire that's been great, that I've studied, that I can use some of the virtues and skills to begin to formulate a new ideal of myself. And these people began to contemplate what-ifs, possibilities, potentials of who they could become. And as they did this, the brain began to change. They began to think differently. And the thinking process began to format connections in their brain that started to act as a platform for them to be. So they began to gather information. They began to examine other options, different than the way they've been being for the last several years of their life. Now, the last thing that they had in common, which was the fourth thing, was that when these people reinvented themselves, they spent long moments where they lost track of time and space. In other words, they became so involved with what they were thinking about, so immersed in who they were becoming, that when they opened their eyes or when they turned on the light in the room or when they lifted their blindfolds up, it seemed like five minutes to them, but actually an hour and a half or two hours went by. And they were literally becoming so immersed in what they were thinking about that they lost track of time and space. They lost track of the feedback that takes place between the body and the brain. They lost track of the feedback that the brain always perceives in its environment and they lost track of time. Now the brain processes about 400 billion bits of information every single second. But we're only conscious of about 2,000 of those 400 billion bits. Now those 2,000 bits of information of what, in, in reference to where our awareness exists only has to do with three things. It has to do with our feedback from the body, feedback from the environment, and our feedback in reference to time. You know, does your back hurt? Are you hungry? Do you have a headache? Are you thirsty? Are you tired? Is it too cold? Is it too warm? Do you like the way it smells in the, in the environment? How long is it going to take before the next experience happens? Our brain and our awareness is immersed in those particular things. And when our brain is immersed in those particular things, even though the brain is processing 400 billion bits of information, we keep our awareness on only 2,000 of those 400 billion bits. And it has to do with the body, the environment, and time. These people who had spontaneous remissions, they move their awareness from those particular things to those other bits of information. And when they did that, we're beginning to learn from a scientific standpoint is that's the moment that the brain begins to pattern new circuits and new connections. So this began an interesting study for me because I wanted to know, based on these four things, what was happening in the brain to determine what was happening in these people's physical bodies. Could it be that they changed their mind, and by changing their mind, it had a physiological effect in their body? Now, some of these people weren't vegetarians, they didn't do crystals, they didn't fast, they didn't do any alternative therapies. All they did was they changed their mind. And by changing their mind, it produced some measurable results in their life. 
So I began this process as, of understanding how the brain makes new circuits and makes new connections. Now, I want to talk a little bit about the way science has progressed over the last couple hundred years, and I'm going to tie it into our understanding of the brain. Back in the 17th century, there was a man by the name of Descartes, and he was a French scientist. He was sitting by a fountain one day, and he was trying to understand the nature of reality. And while he was, as he was sitting by this fountain, he said, you know, I'm having difficulty merging two ideas. See, there's an objective world. You know, there's an objective world he called the sphere of science, where things behave like a machine. He said the earth and all of its laws and all of physical reality behave in a very physical mannerism. And those, those physical traits are very predictable and they're very repeatable. And he said, I'm going to call that the sphere of science. And anything that has to do with the objective are very large. Science can study. And then he said, well, anything that has to do with the mind or our subjective world or subjective reality, I'm going to give to religion because religion has a better handle on it. And really what Descartes was saying is, I want the freedom to be able to study science without having to deal with those other issues. And so the church began to focus on all the principles of subjective world and, and mind. So the church became always mind, never matter, and science was always matter, never mind. And things worked really well because up until this point, you know, this, the church delving into science created some problems and science delving into the mind created some problems as well because uh, if we look at Bruno or we look at um, Galileo, we can see that when they made their particular observations, it defied the church and of course there were some speed bumps along the way. And it, was, it served Descartes very well because he didn't have to deal with issues other than things that were predictable because he was a scientist by nature. He didn't want to deal with influences by the church because if we study history, if we study Galileo Galilei, or we study Giordano Bruno or in earlier times, when they said that the earth was no longer the center of the universe, they were persecuted by the church because it went against the very doctrines that ran the church. So Descartes had his own freedom now to study the nature of reality. And things worked really well, and by observation, scientific laws began to develop. And in the 18th century, along came Sir Isaac Newton. And Newton basically said, there are certain definite laws that we can actually put a scientific value on. He knew that force and mass and acceleration are related. And Newton said, if I know the starting point of something, and I know its velocity or its speed, I can determine where it's going to end up. And because of Newton, we're able to put a rocket on the moon. If we know the distance from the Earth to the moon and the, the rotation of the Earth and how fast we're going to shoot that rocket, because of Newtonian laws and Newtonian physics, we're able to do some very specific things based on the very large and very objective laws. And things worked really well, and science continued to emerge. And then in the 19th century, Albert Einstein comes up with his theory of relativity and his theory of light. And Einstein basically said, nothing can travel faster than the speed of light. Anything as an object or mass that travels faster than the speed of light will ultimately become energy. And because of his laws in understanding relativity, he emerged even greater understandings about objective reality. When Einstein published his papers, the most amazing thing about Einstein was that there was no real footnotes to his information and which blew most of the scientists away in, uh, during his time. And he was a visionary, and he understood the way things worked because he applied his mind. And so Einstein, Einstein's theories uh, pushed science into a greater degree in, in its acceleration. And then after that, he, Einstein began to work with this principle called the photoelectric effect. And what he was doing is he was pr producing very strong electrical currents into steel plates, and he wanted to see the energy that was emitted uh, in terms of ele electrons and protons and, and uh, neutrons. And what, what he, when he started to study what the electrons were doing, instead of the electrons releasing energy in a very continuous and normal fashion, the electrons released energy and dropped the level, like it was moving down a staircase, instead of moving very smooth and continuous. Now, Einstein stopped because the way things work in the very large is that when energy is released, things move in a very continuous fashion. For example, if we drop an apple from a tree, it moves in a very continuous and predictable fashion. And they expected 
in the photoelectric effect, the very same things to happen. They didn't. And so Einstein began to see that the very tiny started to be, behave very different than the very large. And so there were a series of experiments that began to focus attention on electrons and where electrons would be. And when they began to observe electrons and the nature of electrons and how they behaved, they noticed that wherever they observed or looked for an electron, an electron appeared. So the electron went from a wave of probability to all of a sudden collapsing into a very definite particle. And now this whole idea of Cartesian dualism, what Descartes said back in the 17th century, started to get fuzzy again. Because now the subjective person and subjective mind was beginning to have a direct effect on the very objective. And so now the separation between mind and reality and mind and objective began to merge again. And independent of who was doing the observation, whether they had an academic degree or they didn't have an academic degree, that their actual observation had an effect on the quantum field. And so quantum physics was born as a result of it. And now, that means now that all of us, every single person, independent of their creed or their culture or their gender or their age or their race, that every single person, when they're asked to observe something, has an effect on the very tiny that we're all participants in the nature of reality. Now, science may say, well, quantum physics and the observer observing reality and having an effect on reality only works for the very tiny. In other words, only the very tiny respond, uh, responds to our observation. And so maybe then the way in which reality works is that if our observation makes a difference in the way that small subatomic particles function, maybe we can direct on the nature of reality based on our own observation. Now, most quantum physicists will say no. Our observation only works for the very tiny and not the very large. And my answer is, maybe we're just poor observers. Maybe observation is a skill, just like anything else. And we can develop this idea called observation. Now, there is a part of the brain that we use to pay attention. There's a part of the brain that we use to observe and it's called the frontal lobe. The frontal lobe is the crowning achievement of the human being. It is the latest on the scene in our human development. What separates us from every other species on the planet is not the fact that we stand on two feet, or the fact that we have opposing thumbs, or the fact that our eyes point straight ahead, or that we have bigger brains, because elephants actually have bigger brains than us. It's not the fact that we have little body hair. What separates us from every other species on the planet is the size of the frontal lobe in reference to the rest of the brain. Now, in human beings, the frontal lobe is almost 40% of the entire brain. Our next closest ancestor, great apes and chimpanzees, the frontal lobe is about 17% to 15%. In dogs, it's about 7%. And for you cat lovers, it's about 3.5%. So what separates us and makes us great is our frontal lobe in reference to the rest of the brain. Now, the frontal lobe is the executive. It decides on action. It regulates behavior. It's the part of the brain that we use when we're planning, we're speculating, when we're inventing, when we're looking at possibilities. The frontal lobe, if we were to use one word to describe the frontal lobe, we would use the word intent or purpose. When people's intention matches their behavior, or when their behavior matches their intention, or when their thoughts are aligned with their action, is the moment the frontal lobe is at its greatest moment. Now, in the recent journals in November of 2004, a group of scientists from the University of Wisconsin began to see if observation and paying attention was a skill like anything else. And what they did is they designed this experiment where they took a group of Buddhist monks, monks who have been meditating and focusing on concepts like compassion and love and divinity for extended periods of time. And most of the monks that they studied had over 10,000 to about 50,000 hours of focused meditation. So these guys knew how to pay attention. And they took another control group of people who never really went inward and focused their mind on anything. And they said to the monks, would you train these guys over a course of a week and see if we can get these people to learn how to develop a skill called meditation. And so they, they hooked the monks 
brains up to 256 electrodes over their entire brain, and they were going to measure what type of activity took place when these monks paid attention. And of course, they were going to do the same thing with the control group. Now, these eight particular monks, when they got hooked up to these particular um, scans, the moment that they began to focus on a concept like compassion, the moment they began to focus on an idea and went in, inward, their frontal lobes lit up like nothing that the scientists ever seen before. The amount of activity that was taking place in the frontal lobe was enormous. And when they compared that to the control group, the people who were just learning how to focus their mind and pay attention, their ability to hold that focused thought produced very little effects in the frontal lobe. Now, the scientists knew that a particular area in the frontal lobe, on the left side of the frontal lobe, is a place where we experience joy and happiness. And in one particular monk, his brain scan activity was so enlarged in the frontal lobe that the scientists said he must be the happiest man on the planet because his activity was that great. Now, when the scientists began to speculate and look at the effects of this experiment, they began to realize that maybe observation and paying attention is a skill. Maybe it's a skill, just like tennis or golf, that we can develop the skill of paying attention. And by developing the skill, we could get better at it. And the, the effects and the results are that our brain actually changes. So observation, then, is a skill, just like anything else. And if we can develop the skill of observation, maybe just not only the small subatomic particles will respond to our world, but maybe even larger subatomic particles or larger objects will respond based on our ability to observe. Now, back in the 1930s in the United States, there was an experiment done on a, on a group of chimpanzees that were aggressive, and they had an antisocial personality traits. And the scientists said, well, let's see, by doing an experiment on their frontal lobe and doing an operation on their frontal lobe, if it changed the way these chimpanzees behaved. And so they took an instrument that looked like an ice pick, and they tapped it into the frontal lobes of these chimpanzees, and they swirled it around. It was called the ice pick experiment. And after the experiment, the monkeys became very docile and very controllable, and they no longer were aggressive with other chimpanzees. Now, during this time in the United States, in the late 1930s, there were several mental institutions that were overcrowded with people with the exact same condition, antisocial personality disorders, aggressive traits. And because the depression was going on in the 1930s, uh, it took an enormous amount of money to medicate these people to keep them under control. So the scientists in a particular university in the Midwest said, why don't we try this experiment out on some of these people in these mental institutions, we can save on a, a lot of money on the medications that we're administering. So what they did is they took these people and they, they brought them into an operating room while they were asleep, and they anesthetized them with sodium pentothal. And while they were anesthetized, they took a scalpel and they slid it under their eyelid and punctured the softest part of the skull, which is right behind the, uh, the orbit of the eye. And when they uh, punctured the, the uh, skull, in that particular area, they took a, a scalpel and they ran it back and forth, and it was called the windshield wiper experiment. And of course, as we know, that's called a lobotomy. And when they pulled the scalpel out, they sewed them up and they brought the people back to the room, and uh, these people all of a sudden began to behave differently. Now, they noticed some very interesting things about these people uh, that were the, re uh, the effects of the lobotomy. The first thing that they noticed is that all of these people became lazy and lethargic. The next thing they noticed is that they became uninspired. They lost their initiative to do things. They also noticed that they had a tremendous desire for sameness. In other words, they loved to listen to the same radio station. They loved to eat the same food. They loved to wear the same clothes. And if you disrupted their routine in any way, they would emotionally fall apart. So they had a tremendous desire for sameness. They also noticed that these people couldn't focus on single-minded tasks. In other words, they would start something and become distracted and start something else. And then they would become distracted and start something else. They never completed a cycle of action. They also noticed that they failed to gain meaning out of situations. They couldn't learn anything new. They couldn't modify their behavior. Learning is 
modifying our behavior. So they got so stuck in the routine of doing something over and over again repetitively that they never modified their behavior in, in any condition. And the last thing they noticed was that they couldn't project into the future. They couldn't plan into the future. They couldn't project ideas into the future. For example, if they were bending over and tying their shoelace and the shoelace broke, instead of getting a new shoelace, they would continually try to tie the same shoelace even though it was broken. So if we think about this now, frontal lobe damage produces certain effects in people. People become lazy and lethargic, uninspired. They have a loss of initiative. They have a desire for sameness. They don't do anything new. They can't project into the future. They don't, they don't learn anything new. And they get distracted easily. Now that's starting to begin to sound like the majority of people in our culture. And the reason being is because we haven't mastered the ability to use the frontal lobe properly. So maybe we haven't mastered the skill of observation. Maybe observation is a skill in itself. And maybe most people are so distracted by their external world that they don't use the frontal lobe properly. If we think about it, everything in our environment is constantly feeding the brain information. Our senses are what allow us to interpret reality. Our senses are what allow us to respond to information from our external world. Now, as long as we believe that the external world is more real than the internal world, we'll always be using the same circuits in our brain to process that information. The moment we begin to accept that the internal world has an effect on the external world, we have to begin to use the frontal lobe. Now, we know scientifically, it's true, absolutely true, that the brain is shaped and molded from our environment. We know that specifically. But what science is beginning to learn as well is that our brain is shaped and molded by our ability to pay attention. And that when we have the ability to pay attention, and we have the ability to learn knowledge and wire that knowledge in our brain, we begin to make new circuits. And when we're able to make new circuits, we begin to perceive reality differently based on the way our brain is wired. Now here's an example. Let's suppose that I took a picture of a painting, say from Monet, and I put a picture of Monet on a screen up here. And I said, take a look at this painting from Monet and just enjoy the picture. Most people would look at the painting for a few minutes, recognize certain objects in the painting, and be done with it. Now, if I took that painting down and I said to you, I want to tell you some things about Monet. Did you know that Monet spent 44 years of his life being able, making an attempt to be able to see how things are unified in, this, in the world? He was specifically interested in the way light works. He loved the light first thing in the morning, and he loved light at the sunset and at dusk. And that he thought that most people never stopped to pay attention the way light affected flowers and the way they affected colors in the environment. So he went out of his way to paint with pastels and paint with colors to brighten things based on the light at that particular time in the day. And he said things like, the bridge and the wisteria are never really separate. They're one and the same, and I can only paint them that way. And as he got older, he developed cataracts. And his cataracts became very thick. And so when he perceived light, the light that he was perceiving diffused into his eye and he was actually beginning to paint exactly what he saw. Now if I gave you that information and I put the picture back up and you looked at this Monet again, more than likely you would perceive it differently based on your ability to pay attention to details. And actually what we did in that moment is we gave you knowledge and information that your brain filtered out of the equation and you were only looking at the picture based on the way your brain was wired, based on what you knew. The moment we give the brain new information and the brain can pay attention through the frontal lobe to that information, we begin to see things that already existed but we've filtered out of the equation. Another example, a wine connoisseur. If a wine connoisseur swirls wine and he tastes wine, he has the circuitry in his brain or her brain to be able to notice the subtleties. He could taste the tannins and the acids, he could smell the bouquet and the, and the aromas. It could, it could uh, be further assembled into more specific things about oaks and specific types of grapes.
And because his brain has been educated and because he's made the circuits, because he's paid attention to notice the difference in, in the reality called tasting wine, he's able to pick up the subtleties. Now, the person who isn't wired for that particular experience and doesn't have the, the, the connections in their brain to know what to look for, that wine will taste just like every, everybody else's wine. And that's how reality works. We perceive reality based on how the brain is wired. Now, scientists have done some experiments to see if this is actually true. What they came to realize is that it is. They took a group of people and they asked them if they wanted to participate in an experiment where they were going to wear a set of glasses for two weeks. Now, these glasses weren't just ordinary glasses. The glasses were divided in half. And when they looked to the left, they saw blue. And when, when they looked to the right, they saw yellow. So the lenses of the glasses were divided so that blue was on one side and yellow was on the other. And they said to these people, we want you to wear these lenses with everything that you do during your day. We want, to, we want you to wear them when you take your kids to school. We want you to wear them when you go to work. We want you to wear them when you're doing all your normal activity. And we want you to wear them for two weeks. And so these, all different people wore these glasses for a period of time. And at the end of the experiment, they invited the participants back into the laboratory. And when they brought the participants into the laboratory, they said to them, now we, what we want you to do is look at this piece of paper. And, and it was a white sheet of paper. And they said, what color do you see when you look at this paper? Now, every single person that participated in the experiment said, that's a white piece of paper. And they said, well, look to the left. Do you see a blue piece of paper when you look at that paper? And they said, no. And they said, when you look to the right, do you see a yellow piece of paper? And they said, no. So the scientists had to back up because they realized that these people were filling in reality based on their memory. They were overlaying the way things appeared based on the circuits that they already had wired. And the more they participated in the world, the faster the color disappeared for them. And essentially, that's what we do in reality. Our brain is wired a certain way. We're given a certain amount of circuits in our life. And then we add to those circuits by the way we make the connections based on the knowledge we gain. And, and if we don't learn any new knowledge, we keep using the same circuits, which allows reality to appear the exact same way. If we're given knowledge and information, and that knowledge and that information is unconventional, if it's outside the box of what's accepted scientifically, socially, politically, if it's outside the box of what's re even religiously accepted, maybe we'll begin to perceive reality differently based on what that knowledge that we've received. Now, in studying these spontaneous remissions with people that uh, heal themselves of various conditions, it was interesting to note that independent of their culture or independent of their creed or independent of their educational st status or their religion, independent of their gender, they basically said, I'm going to observe a different outcome. And I'm going to hold on to this observation independent of the feedback from my body, independent of the feedback from my environment, and independent of time. Now, the frontal lobe, the crowning achievement of the human being, allows us to do that. You see, the frontal lobe gives us permission to make thought more real than anything else. The frontal lobe gives us permission to hold on to a concept, to hold on to an idea, to hold on to a vision or a dream, independent of the circumstances that exist in our world independent of the circumstances that exist in our body, independent of the circumstances that exist in, in reference to time. And those are the things and the traits that we secretly admire in all great people in antiquity, whether it was Martin Luther King or William Wallace, someone who had a vision, someone who had an idea. A hero said, I believe in these morals and I be believe in these ethics. And even though my environment isn't aligned with my thinking, my thinking is more important than my environment. And the frontal lobe in the human being allows us the privilege. It gives us the privilege to make thought more real than anything. Now, most species in, in nature, the way in which they change is that they're subjected to some harsh environmental stimuli. They're subjected to something the in the environment. And then they have to adapt or they have to accommodate or if they they have to acclimate to some type of environmental stimulus, whether it's cold or whether it's heat 
or whether it's any particular thing. And what happens is, is that the species is introduced into this particular environment, and then over a series of generations, as the same species is introduced to the same harsh environment, over a period of time, over several generations, that species will modify its behavior and change its genetics. That's called evolution. But human beings don't have to do that. Because of the size of the frontal lobe and because of our ability to speculate possibilities and ask about potentials and think about the what-ifs, we can invent new ideas and new ways of being. And it gives us the privilege then to modify our behavior in the same lifetime. It gives us the privilege to modify our actions in a week. We can modify how we behave in a day and we can change in a moment. The only object that we need to master is this skill called observation. When we begin to use the brain properly, when we begin to pay attention to a concept or to an idea, this amazing thing happens in the brain. The frontal lobe lowers the volume to the external stimuli. It lowers the volume to the body and the feedback loop from the body to the brain. It lowers the volume to the feedback from the environment. You don't know if it's cold or warm. You don't know if, it, if it's uh, dark or light. Your brain becomes the, mag the magnifier of thought. And it lowers the volume to time. In other words, as we hold the concept in the frontal lobe, we will lose track of time and space. Now, science is beginning to understand that the way in which we make circuits in the brain, the way in which we begin to make connections in the brain, aside from allowing the environment to mold and shape our brain, that we can begin to mold and shape our brain by paying attention. And if we can hold on to an idea, we begin to wire those connections in our brain. By wiring those connections in our brain, we begin to leave footprints of those concepts neurologically in the tissues. And those footprints then can act as the foundation in the way in which we can act and behave. So the frontal lobe then, the crowning achievement of the human being, allows thought to be more real than anything else. And when we begin to assemble ideas, and we begin to assemble concepts, and we put all of our attention on that concept, the frontal lobe will lower the volume to all the extraneous stimuli. And the only thing that will become real is thought itself. When that happens, there's a physical change in the brain. The brain then takes that holographic image that we're holding in the frontal lobe and creates a pattern of connections that associate with that concept or that idea. So when we learn new things, when we're learning new things, we make connections in our brain. We make new connections in our brain. When we memorize those things or when we remember those things, we sustain those connections or we maintain those connections. Memory is maintaining those connections, learning is forming those connections. So we can learn from the environment. We can learn from our sensual experiences. But then we can only be as great as how our environment is dictating our experience. But if we learn knowledge and we learn information that's unconventional, quantum physics, that the observer participates in the nature of reality and that our thoughts actually matter, from the subatomic particles all the way to the very large, and that maybe our observation, our ability to pay attention, will begin to format new connections in our brain that will allow us to perceive things exactly the way they are. And that may be because our brain processes billions of bits of information every second. But we're only aware of those bits of information that have to do with the body, the environment, and time. That we can begin to make new connections and learn new knowledge. We'll begin to see what has always existed but we filtered out of the equation, just like those people that did the experiment with the lenses. Now, I want to talk about how the brain learns and how those connections are formulated. We know from a scientific standpoint that neurons, nerve cells that exist in the brain, when they connect, they exchange information. And as they connect and they exchange information, that connecting point is, is a learned understanding related to a concept. As I said, when we remember something, we activate those connections again and bring them to life. Now, we have enormous amounts of connections in our brain. 
infinite connections, just about trillions and trillions of connections. And every place where those neurons connect and exchange information, it's mapped as a pattern or a sequence that reflects some idea, something that we've learned, a trait, a behavior, a skill, a tendency, a feeling even. And all these connections are the sum total of who we are as an individual. So everybody's different because they have had different experiences in their life, they've learned different knowledge, and they have a certain amount of genetic connections that they're given. And that's basically the foundation of where we start from as individuals. Now most people at a certain point in their life rely on those developed circuits and never learn anything new. They allow feeling be to become the means of thinking. They stop learning and they start feeling. And when we get to the point where learning is stopped and feeling is initiated, that's when we're living out our genetic propensities. That's when we're living out the predetermined genetic future that exists for us as individuals. When we learn new knowledge, the brain begins to reformat itself. It begins to fire in new sequences and new patterns and in new connections. And if we can maintain those connections for an extended period of time, we can modify and change our behavior. And those people who had spontaneous remissions, they, what they did was they gained knowledge and they began to apply that knowledge by asking what ifs. And they understood if they could connect with that intelligence that was keeping their heart beating and digesting their food. If they could whisper in the ear of the giant that was running their physical body, that knew how to make cells, that knew how to organize deep, if they could have their will match its will, if they could have their mind match its mind, if they could have their love of life match its love of life, because it was what's continuously giving what was continuously giving them life. If they they, they reasoned that by changing their thoughts, would it send a new signal to their cells? And by patterning new connections in their brain, would it ultimately produce a new physiological effect in their, effect in their body? So the reinvention process meant to reorganize those circuits to a greater ideal of themselves. Now we have a couple different types of learning that we have in the brain. We have learning divided in two different areas. When we learn something and we memorize it, one particular area is called what's called explicit learning. Now explicit learning, another name for it, is called declarative learning or declarative memory. Declarative memories are things that we can declare. One of the aspects of declarative memory is, is knowledge, information, philosophy. For example, if you learn new information, new knowledge, intellectual data, philosophy. Every time we do that, the brain makes particular type of circuits. The second type of declarative memory is called experience. Experience, then, are things that we can declare. We can declare that uh, I'm a man. I can declare that I know where I was on 9-11. I can declare that I like apples because I've had those experiences. So the memory systems in the brain that have to do with declarative memories have a very specific sequence in which the brain formats that information. It's formatted in the thinking brain. It's formatted in the part of the brain where conscious awareness exists. And, and that particular sequence of knowledge and experience allows the brain to function in reality. We can function in the external environment because we use declarative memory consciously to make decisions. We use declarative memory consciously to project the future. We're using declarative memory function in our world to make decisions every single day. And that, that type of memory system is intact so that we can function in our world. Now the second type of memory system is called implicit memories. Now implicit memory systems are very powerful systems because implicit memories are things that we can't declare. It's called non-declarative memory. That non-declarative memory are, thi are things like um, skills and habits and conditionings and traits and propensities and even behaviors that those traits and behaviors have been practiced and executed so many times that we no longer have to think about it anymore. They're called procedural memories and we have hundreds of procedural memories that's formatted in our brain. Now those procedural memories are things like driving a stick shift in our car. When we drive a stick shift in our car,
We've practiced it so many times that we don't even have to think about it anymore. It's wired neurologically as a complete circuit. When we brush our teeth, when we put on makeup, when we type, when we walk, those are all procedural or non-declarative memories. And the brain processes that information differently because it goes beyond our conscious thoughts. It goes beyond our conscious memories. It's wired to us so that we don't even have to declare it. For example, when you can't remember a phone number consciously in your explicit system, you could grab the phone and look at the numbers, and your hands will begin to move, and you'll remember the numbers. That's called an implicit memory because your body's practiced it so much, it remembers it as well as your brain. Now, implicit memories are the point in which we hardwire behavior. Implicit memories are when we are actually it. Implicit memories are when we've completely made a change. So if we think about it, if we make connections in the brain by learning knowledge, learning knowledge is beginning to make new circuits. That's philosophy. The brain has changed as a result of it. But there isn't much change in terms of sending signals to the body, new information to the body. It's intellectual information. When we have a new experience, when we personalize that knowledge, when we take knowledge and we personalize it or apply it, we can set up a new experience. And that new experience then allows us to format and change our behavior. So knowledge then applied creates a new experience. That experience then creates a certain amount of circuits in the brain that further advances the knowledge that we learn. And we can declare that we've had a new experience. So knowledge is thinking. It is our thinking brain. When we learn new knowledge, we learn that knowledge to think from. Experience requires applying that knowledge, and we call that doing. That's the doing aspect of how the brain learns. So we could have an experience based on knowledge that we've learned. We can apply that knowledge and have a new experience, but that isn't enough. Because when we have a new experience, the idea then is to be able to repeat that experience. And when we can repeat that experience over and over again, over and over again, we begin to wire to that implicit memory system. And that new, that new way of remembering something is called being it. We're actually being it now. So. Learning, learning new knowledge is the thinking part of our brain. Applying that knowledge, applying what we've learned, applying our thought to have a new experience, modifying our behavior to have a new experience is called the doing, doing it. And then when we continuously are able to repeat that experience over and over again, and repeat it over and over again, we begin to wire the brain to that implicit system called being it. Now, when we're being something, we don't have to think about it anymore. It's wired permanently. That process is natural. It's second nature. It's easy. And those people who had spontaneous remissions, as they began to gain new knowledge and apply that knowledge to set up some new experiences for themselves, they didn't stop there. They went further until that system was hardwired in their body, till they actually were able to become it. You see, once we can become something, now it's wired permanently so that we no longer have to think about it. And the idea then is if there's automatic systems in our brain, automatic programs in our brain that define thinking and feeling our entire life, thinking as a victim, thinking as an insecure person. And if we think those insecure thoughts, it makes the chemicals that make us feel insecure. See, then once we feel insecure, then the brain starts to think the way it's feeling. So those people who had spontaneous remissions from diseases, those people who healed themselves of different conditions, they made some pretty physical changes in their brain. The changes that they made weren't just about intellectually embracing this information. It wasn't just about having an experience once. They wanted to actually become somebody else. And when they reinvented themselves, when they said, I believe there's an intelligence that exists within me that gives life to every single individual, whether they're happy or sad, whether they're wealthy or poor, whether they're holy or unholy, that some intelligence gives life to every human being. If I could tap into that intelligence and become somebody else, 
it'll give life to who, I'm new, who, who this new person emerges as. And that if my thoughts matter, I'm going to have to really construct some permanent neurological connections in my brain to become this new platform of being. And that I have to abandon and surrender that old way of thinking and feeling that was really tied to my environment, really tied to the way in which uh, I, f I thought about my world based on my old self. And maybe those old feelings and those old connections were really tied to old experiences. And maybe by reinventing myself, there'll be a period where I have no feeling. Maybe those old emotions and those old feelings were tied to some old experience that were actually the cause of the condition in the first place. And by abandoning those old thoughts and those old feelings, just abandoning them and replacing it with a new idea of self, that a new signal was running to the body and the person was actually free. And then all they had to do was separate themselves from people and things and the distraction of the environment and time and episodes and events and let thought become more real than anything else. In the process of rehearsing, in the process of thinking about who they wanted to become, in the process of thinking about it over and over again, they began to make those circuits more permanent. They began to create a new individual. They began to emerge as a new being. And as a result of it, that process where they developed the skill of paying attention, they developed the ability to move their mind away from their body. They developed the ability to move their mind away from the environment. And they even moved their mind away from the reference of time. And the moment they did that, maybe the door to the quantum field opened. Maybe now they were stepping into a new level of mind. And when that happens, when we can make thought more real than anything else, the brain begins to format those patterns and connections that are equal to who we are and who we're becoming. So these people who had spontaneous remissions, maybe it wasn't a miracle at all. Maybe they just became somebody else. And maybe they believed that this, this intelligence would stand behind them and give life to whoever they were being. And maybe this intelligence was smarter than them and brighter than them and had more will than them to step in and reorganize their body for them. And that all they had to do was to become somebody different. And when they became somebody different, this intelligence gave life to them, and their life changed, their health changed, and their future changed. And maybe these people who had spontaneous remissions gave up the feelings and the emotions that were tied to the past, and in the process of becoming somebody new, in the process of that reinvention process where they made new circuits to operate from, they abandoned their past and their association to their past and all of the feelings and the emotions that went along with it. And maybe the chemicals that were feeding the body based on those thoughts were no longer made. And because they were no longer made, the signal that was being sent to the body was a new signal. And that new signal that was sent to the body had nothing to do with their association to those past attitudes, those past thoughts and those past feelings. But now the person had an idea of their future. They had an idea of something to look forward to. And now, as they began to make those changes, they no longer sent the same signal to the body, but they sent a new signal to the body based on how they were now being. So, if we think about this then, the whole idea of this separation between mind and matter, the separation between the objective and the subjective, may actually begin to merge when we apply these principles together. Maybe quantum physics gives us permission to say that my observation matters. And maybe the frontal lobe, the crowning achievement of the human being, allows us to modify our behavior in one lifetime and to grow new circuits and new connections as a new place of being. And that this merging now that takes place between mind and matter basically says this, my thought matters. And because my thought matters, it should have a direct effect on the closest thing that exists to me, which is my physical body. And if we can begin to merge these ideas, we've come com a complete circle back to understanding that there is no separation, that mind actually gives life to matter, and that it is our mind as individuals 
that can merge with a greater mind. And as we merge with this greater mind, we're now enacting the skill of observation. We move our attention away from our body. We move our attention away from the environment. And we forget about time. And when we do that now, pure mind has a direct effect on the physical body. And it has a direct effect on the nature of reality. And it has a direct effect on matter. And when we begin to um, uh, execute these ideas and we begin to apply them to our life, we get to be the scientist in measuring our own observation. And maybe that's the beginning understanding, the beginning understanding of what it is.